fourth preliminary session of IIT 2003. Before we start, I want to give, a, give you an announcement. This particular session is proceeded as a part of the joint conference of the IAPT, International Association of Practical Theology, and KSCR, Korean Society of Christian Religious Education. So we have members here of KSCRA here. So welcome to Yonji University and IAPT 2023. Okay, now it's time we start the fourth keynote session. And then I have a question. What day is it today? <laughs> it's Saturday, isn't it? And uh, it's the fourth day of our conference. <laughs> and why you are you here? <laughs> we are exhausted, so go out and enjoy campus or Korean culture, but why you are here? I think mostly it is because Dr. Mary has a bit more. <laughs> She's going to share important wisdom that she got from trees, ants, and human communities with us. So you are all here to listen to her acknowledgement. Am I correct? Yes. Great. So it is my honor to introduce you the lecturer of the fourth keynote speech. Manuel Elizabeth Moore is Dean Emerita and Professor Emerita of Theology and Education of Boston University from Theology. Her current research focuses on the integral relationship between secondary and Tikkun Olam, or repair of the wall through the study of ecological and justice practices, theological and existential issues in London. As a practical theologian, she draws on research into the practices, theories, and poetics of cultural and racial diversity, ecological justice, interreligious relationships, liberative theology, education, leadership, peacemaking, white privilege, gender sexuality, and healing social transformation. Her recent book publications include Teaching as a Sacramental Act and the Editing or co editing of Deep Understanding for Divisive Times, A Living Tradition, Critical Recovery and Reconstruction of Western Heritage, and Children on Youth and Spirituality in the Southern World. Her recent articles include Responding to a Weeping Planet, Practical Theology as a Discipline Called by Crisis, the hidden force of gender and sexuality, the cadaver of truth seeking, embracing sexuality and gender toward radical love, and sacred revolutionary teaching, encountering sacred difference and honest heart, disrupting white privilege, diving beneath shame and guilt, encountering dignity, building human community, and deep breathing in a moving world. And I particularly like the last sentence. She also enjoys the pleasure of writing poetry. Then why don't we invite Mary Elizabeth Moore here and listen to her academic, poetic, and practical concerns. The title of the lecture is Wisdom of Trees, Ants, and Human Communities, Practical Wisdom at a Cultural. Please give a big warm hand to Dr. Mary Elizabeth First, I want to say a huge thank you for the privilege of speaking with you this morning. It's one of the high privileges of my life, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, if you knew my biography, you would understand. I also feel privileged to be here in the presence of so many people that I've known for many, many years. People that I know, respect, look up to, people I have loved as family, and continue to love, people who are young and full of energy and excitement and vision, thank you very much for this community. And so we begin. Wisdom of trees, ants, and human communities. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. The Earth's climate is warming much more rapidly than predicted. In fact, the latest study, IPCC study in 2023, 
is clear that the Earth's climate is warming much more rapidly than had been predicted. The poor human communities are almost always the ones who are most affected. And the rate of change will continue to multiply as human cause factors and others compound and create an escalating climate catastrophe. I really appreciate the foresight of the IEPT planning team who chose this subject two years ago, 2020, and the escalation of global trauma has surpassed even what they predicted at that time. So we live in a planet with rising sea levels, shrinking ice caps, and sinking landmass, where island nations and many coastal communities, including poor coastal communities, face unprecedented peril. From the sea washing across their homelands, and from the loss of land, lives, and economy. As storms intensify, the climate has warmed. But nations, local governments, and industries have continued. Oh, thank you very much. I should have checked. Can you all hear now? Good. Um, and if you, if you don't mind, if you're not hearing, please wave, because I know what it's like. As storms intensify, the, the climate has warmed, but nations, local governments, and industries have continued to delay and minimize the actions they take to repair, reverse, and protect even the little that we can still do. The questions that face the human communities are, and I How will we deepen our knowing and understanding? How will we find the requisite courage and capacities to respond in ways that protect, heal, and repair? And when I use those words, I'm not being naive. We, we will not be able to repair all that is. But there are ways that we can participate in protection, healing, and repair. The question that faces human communities are these, and I would like to respond with, to these questions by posing that what we need is radical change. Radical change in the way we live, the way we think, the way we do our research, the way we teach, the way we engage with family, friends, politics, and international relations. Such change is urgent if we are to imagine and live toward ecological justice and hope. I propose that the place to begin is the experiences and practices of the non-human natural world, which we as practical theologians can experience and observe alongside the human natural world. I urge this beginning point as a way to push our boundaries as practical theologians who are concerned to live well with the world and to upturn the destructive powers of anthropocentric, anthropocentric individualistic, and industrial technocratic dominance in our field and in our world. I also argue that the beginning point for theological reasons, the begin. Okay, I'm behind on the slide. Just, just be patient when that happens. <laughs> um, and you notice the picture I selected here. I will, I will make a comment. I don't think we engage only with our scientific research. Our scientific research is incredibly important. But we also engage through meditation, through presence, and through many other ways of being with the non human, natural world. I also urge a beginning point of radical change as a, for a theological reason. Many religions of the world, notably Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, understand and profess and practice that 
the natural world reveals God, our Allah, our, our Yahweh, our Vishnu. This doesn't mean that these religions are the same, but I've tracked this and discovered that there is some way of speaking about God's revelation through the, na the natural world, the non-human natural world, in every one of these traditions. So I invite you to consider that when we are studying and attending to the natural world, we are actually engaged in a sacred activity. We are receiving our discerning revelation. So, where, from where does this vision come? Vision's not coming right now, but I think it will come any minute now. <laughs> Practical theology is by its nature a, a discipline of crisis. I made this case in a recent article. Standing on the edge between what is and what can be. So it is a discipline that has vision built into it. I've recently argued that practical theology is, is by nature a discipline of crisis, but I also think this places the emphasis in a different place. It reminds us that when we are addressing very small issues, in a, whether it's in a family or a classroom, or some other kind of relationship, or in a political arena, we are actually facing crises. And they may be small, they may be large, but crises feed one another and they're all interrelated. So to recognize that is to demand of ourselves that we attend to the promises of change and the dangers of change. I would argue that the past 30 years in practical theology has been a period in which we have expanded, and I'm talking about the global work here, we have expanded the range of subjects we address, the range of subjects to whom we attend, the, the range of con concerns that we address, so that now those concerns include um, justice and peace in large and small context, it includes peace, um, it includes ecological concerns and so forth. And all of that means that our discipline over the past 30 years has changed a lot. It's time for a hallelujah. <laughs> this is very good news. And it also means that we have momentum to continue to change. But we have a long way to go. These are the same 30 years, by the way, that the IAPT has been in existence. And this organization has helped to feed that change, to breed it, to help us learn from one another. The accent on future action in practical theology has increasingly turned toward what I'm going to call alternate futures. That is, not just how can we fix this thing that's broken, whether it's in a church or a family relationship or something else. How can we fix it? Yes. But on a larger scale, how can we address the largest, most damaging problems in this world? And how can we understand them beneath the surface and not just the obvious data that tells us things are wrong? I would suggest that calls us to become proclaimers of alternate futures. That doesn't mean we're going to see into the future, but it does mean that we have the opportunity to lean toward the future, to imagine the future, to study it, and to practice toward it, even as we're learning that our practices are flawed and we need to revise them every day, week, 
month, year. Such futures will include exploring and projecting particular practices as well as large meta-visions. And so that means that ecological and social justice, peacemaking, spiritual renewal, and aesthetic knowing are on our radar. And we are called to note that, as, note the, the requirements, the demands that those make of us because they are really calling our names. This is backtracking a little bit on the slide, so this is, this is a recall of the past 30 years. Now I turn to what may be required of us. On whose shoulders do we stand as we seek to imagine and lean practice toward alternative futures. I think our work in Seoul already points in those directions. The papers have been superb. The conversations in sessions and around the edges have likewise been, as have been the immersion trips. We've been constantly learning with and from each other during this time. And a lot of recent research is helpful in this, in this endeavor. Somehow, sorry. Sorry, I, I skipped something. I'm not very well coordinated between the paper and the slideshow. So um, if you will, bear with me because I'd rather you be less uptight about that. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna just be relaxed about it because it's, <laughs> It's, it's happening, and I, uh, I would rather you just relax with me, and uh, we will learn as we go. So from where does our vision come? I'm going to be proposing in this presentation that it comes in part from the non-human natural world. It comes from trees and ants. I chose those two because trees are so lovable, and um, they tend to be endearing to human beings. Ants, not so much. <laughs> but they're both part of this creation in which we live. But we also can learn from those who study the natural world, from biologists, chemists, and others. And I want to share some of what I've learned from biologists. Um, one author whom I think many of you may know is Peter Wollaben who's a German forester, and his book, The Hidden Life of Trees, is a very popular one. And I find him to be very helpful in introducing this paradigm shift that I'm trying to develop here. So he says, this is a quote from him, when I began my professional career as a forester, I had about as much, I knew about as much about hidden life of trees as a butcher knows about the emotional life of animals. Foresters and modern forestry industry produces lumber. So as he began, he had always been a nature lover, that's why he was attracted into forestry. But he found himself studying trees in order to maximize the amount of lumber that was produced. As he began to study the details, the, the odd, oddities, the roots, the gnarled, gnarled branches, and all of the rest in the forest, he began to shift his way of thinking. And then others came into the forest to do studies, scientific studies. He joined with them and he was engaged in scientific studies. And as he did this, he said, he changed. And here's what he writes. When you know that trees experience pain and have memories and that tree parents live together with their children, then you can no longer just chop them. 
and disrupt their lives with large machines. So as a manager of a forest, he convinced the people of the town where this forest was that instead of focusing on lumber, they would focus on managing the forest toward well-being, to thriving. And they could cut down trees when they needed to, but they were careful to do it with people and horses and, and a minimal disruption of the forest as they did it. So his entire perspective changed. And if you look at these quotes, you discover that part of what changed was his internal relationship with the trees and his recognition of the internal relationships within the trees and the forest. I'm suggesting that practical theology needs to move in that kind of direction. That we are not in the business of fixing things. We are often expected to fix things. We're tempted to fix things because there is a lot to fix. But we are in the business of enabling the church, our faith community, our, our local communities, families, political structures, systems to thrive so that all might flourish. Now that is a different way of seeing our role. It's not uncommon, you folks, you folks know that, you do it already. But it does call for different approaches to practical theology. Approaches that are less focused on the, tech, on the technocratic, on the, on the um, the atomistic and the exchange kind of economy where we are simply trying to fix things so they run better. Have larger churches, have, have, um, have smoother running politics. Whether the smooth running politics are damaging people because of hiding issues or not. We are called to be present and and to study deeply the realities of our world so that we can absorb them and live with them and allow them to feed our visions. This is why I've chosen here to focus on trees and ants so that we can get specific. And on whose shoulders do we stand? Our work here in Seoul has already pointed to this, and I've mentioned this already, but uh, some of the recent work in our field is extremely helpful in knowing something about the shoulders upon which we stand. Bonnie Miller McLemore's research article on ecological research and practical theology that came out very recently in the uh, International um, Journal of practical theology is an excellent review article, and it tells us a lot about the shoulders we stand on. The, um, the profusion of writing that is taking place is very exciting, and I'm just gonna lift up a few of those, and as I do it, I'm gonna name some of the themes that are coming out of the recent writing. And one of those themes is the need for alternative epistemologies. And I'm not just talking about some kind of formal epistemology, I'm talking about um, alternate epistemologies that actually reshape our way of being with, our, with the world and with subjects that we, with whom we are studying. And alternate epistemologies that alter the, the, the beings we listen to, whether they are tree beings are human beings who are on the edges of society and are, are rarely heard. So, one of, one of those, um, one of the themes that comes under this one is the need for much, much greater attention to indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples all over the world, whether it's Native Americans, First, um, First Nation people, Maori in New Zealand, tribal people who live in, across the continents of Africa and South America are others. 
we need to listen to indigenous people who've developed capacities to live closely with the earth and to do less damage than, um, than most other people have managed. And they've done it with, is it? Oh, thank you. That is actually a wonderful idea. Thank you very much. Come, Samnida. So one of the people who's done this more, most recently is Mary Hess, who's written about attending to indigenous peoples. Two others who've done this are Leo Shade and Hiran Kim Cragg. So we have a good many people who are working on these questions. And I want also to point out that this is not just happening in practical theology or theology more broadly, it is also happening on, on an international scale. For example, the United Nations has a major program in which they encourage ecological projects at the local level, most often in indigenous communities, and encourage people to take the ideas they're wanting to work on already, or the ideas that they are already working on, to develop their projects, and then to come together at the United Nations to share their projects with one another and to learn with and from one another. Now these projects are, ge are generally localized. They are focused on what is taking place in a particular area. And they generally draw upon the practical wisdom of the people who are doing the projects. So if, if they're taking place in Peru, they are influenced by the Peruvians and their long-time traditions of caring for the earth. That is the United Nations putting its weight behind local, locally born and locally informed ecological projects and creating networks so people can gather together and learn from each other. That is so different from them developing a set of principles and proposals that everyone should follow. So that is an example of an alternate epistemology. A second uh, theme that's in the current literature is trauma and resilience. This has been an increasingly visible theme and because there are, a lot has been written on eco, ecological grief, ecological trauma, and so forth. And some activists have had to quit their work because they're not able to sustain the inner strength to continue their work because of this traumatic grief over what's happening in the world. So trauma and resilience are critical themes in, in the emerging literature. And one of the people who has been working on this in, in our community is Pamela McCarroll, who has written a recent article on this and has actually written on it uh, for a few years in the past as well. So, so we are witnesses to the trauma of trees. We are witnesses to the trauma of rivers and mountains. And part of our role as practical theology, theologians is to bear witness to the trauma. This is a basic idea from trauma studies. It, you can't fix the trauma. It's there, but you can bear witness to it. And you can, by bearing witness, and by people bearing witness with one another, um, patterns of resilience can begin to emerge. That doesn't mean you're fixing it. It means that you're learning to live with it in ways that encourage continued healing and, and support for flourishing. Not, never finished, never finished, but always in process. A third theme from the recent studies is thorough relationality of the natural world. Recognizing that, that the natural world and all ecological action is interrelated with each other. One of the people who's done, the, one pair, team, who've done this recently are Jeannie Pera Kulo and Rosa Kindoza. I think I might be um, making a mess of those names. Um, oh, it's close enough? Hey, Ray. 
<laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. But they have discovered that those who extend ecological care um, can't do it alone. They have to do it in community. And their work has to, has to intersect with one another because all of the factors are interrelated. Intersectionality is a reality. And this research is actually taking that seriously and trying to work on projects that honor the intersectionality and honor the many people in the community that need to, that feel compelled to do something about ecological change. So what is needed is practical wisdom. And I will be brief here because I've written on this quite a bit, but I want to um, define practical wisdom as the embodied accumulating knowledge and ethical insight that arise from human and creaturely experiences of the world and the numinous. I put that on the screen because it's a, it's, it has a lot of words in it. But what I'm trying to say is that practical wisdom is embodied. It is what we feel when we sit under a tree, as well as what we discover when we analyze a, a piece of a tree and try to discover the chemical composition. So embodied practical wisdom is something that, that draws upon all of our capacities, our capacities in aesthetics, analysis, data collection, all of them. And that kind of practical wisdom promises to guide us in some fresh new ways. Now you'll note that I'm taking a different view from uh, Don Browning, who interprets phronesis as practical reason. And that has had a lot of important and positive in influence on practical theology. But phronesis is a word that has been translated many different ways, and the, the, the word lends itself to multiple interpretations. So I'm making a case that phronesis is more like what Jennifer Ayers describes as phronesis, and it is embodied, it includes all of what we learn and how we, how we communicate and reflect on and live with what we learn. That kind of wisdom, by the way, requires us to, to learn from everyone. You can't enter an ecological boardroom with a set of statistics and expect to address environmental crises. That is one thing that needs to happen, but if it's happening in isolation, it is, it is actually undermining the possibility of ecological justice, because it ignores the voices, the experiences, the um, studies, the data that is available through other means. So where do we begin? I propose that we begin with the general approach to practical theology that, that has been um, ex widely accepted in our field. And that is the approach of understanding practical theology as beginning with practice, including reflection and going back to practice. I'm not wanting to argue whether that paradigm is an adequate one. I'm taking that because it's such a common paradigm. But what I want to do is suggest that we need a new paradigm, and I'm going to work from that one to suggest some transformations that I think could be helpful to our common work. What might we learn, for example, if we studied experiences and practices of the whole creation, not just humans, and gave special attention to the non-human natural world? I'm ashamed to say I've been I've been saying that for 30 years, and I didn't get it, and I still don't get it. I wrote a book called Ministering with the Earth, which was a, a more popular kind of book, and was trying to make the case that we don't minister to or for the Earth, but with the Earth. Well, I got that much. But, but what I'm beginning to get now is that we, we need to attend to the other beings that have so much to teach us. 
And that requires a new paradigm. So if, if we are studying human relationships, how are those humans in, interacting with the earth? How are they affected by climate trauma? How are they affected by breathing? living close to trees, walking, enjoying sunshine, are not enjoying sunshine because they're part of a massive city, has no trees and no shade, but only heat. We need to pay attention to all of that, and that requires us to think differently. So I've... I've in, emphasize this point and what I'm what I'm wanting to do is to try to understand it better and to encourage you to help me understand it better and to help one another understand it better another point is that is that um, attending to the non-human natural world is a way of discerning the holy. Often in practical theology, we think of studying practices. Okay, we're gathering all this data, and then we're gonna do theology. We're going to reflect. What I'm suggesting is the very study of subjects, whether they are human or non-human, is itself a theological act. We are discerning the holy through those subjects. And therefore, we have some big reasons to attend to our current popular paradigm and rethink it. So I'm encouraging that, that we do this kind of study for the two reasons that are on the bottom of the screen. And how does that look? Well, here's my first, my first attempt. Um, this is general, but if we begin with practice, what if we begin to think of studying practice as discernment? And recognize that the most technical scientific studies are in fact contributing to discernment. As are meditation, exercise, and so forth. So, if we think of it that way, then we are already engaged in theology as we study practices. And then, when we turn to reflection, we reflect on the Earth's revel revelation, as well as traditions, insights from philosophy, theology, and other sources. Very often, we use language such as so, okay, now that we've studied this, what does theology have to teach us about it? And I'm suggesting that theology is not a disembodied thing that we bring into the conversation midway through our work. But in fact, theology is in our work. Theology is embedded in the very beings, human and non-human, that we study. And therefore, theology is being revealed to us, so when we move into other reflective moments, then we need to take seriously theological learning from the, from the practices and experiences that we've studied. And then practice, the proposals for future practice, are, are proposals for transformative practice. Yes, proposals for how do we organize this set of events we're planning. That's important. How do we change the ethos of our community? That's even more important. How do we create and recreate, critique and reshape culture, including the cultures of our local communities? So we are proposing practices which may be large or small, 
but they are practices that contribute to the reshaping of the world. They are transformative. And of course, we're never finished. The transformation goes on and on, and we're going to learn that the things we thought were great visions and we worked toward and got and accomplished even, well, they were okay. Or maybe they weren't very okay. And so we're continually learning and going through this process of attending, reflecting, posing alternative futures. And I would suggest that that is our mission as practical theologians. So now I am inviting you to play, to experiment more directly with the wisdom of trees and ants. Now this, this experiment, I hope, will put us on a pathway to imagine how we might do practical theology in some fresh ways. This does not mean you're not already doing a lot of this. It means that we're thinking together about what we do and how we might envision fresh directions and understandings of our work. So first, let's learn from trees and ants. One of the most obvious things we learn from trees is relationality. The world is relational all the way down. And trees epitomize that. The, the banyan tree that was in the previous slide is one tree. And if you stepped way back, you would discover it, 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 it might go a mile or two, depending upon who's chopped, chopped it down, because it'll continue growing. And it's all connected. If you look at the aspen trees in the United States, uh, there is a vast area of um, the West that is covered with aspen trees. They are all one tree. The largest living organism and the oldest living organism in the world. So trees reveal connect relationality. And so as not to be completely um, speaking in prose, I'll introduce this section with poetry. Trees wave overhead and root below, bound with plants and granite, streams and cascading falls, owls and eagles, chickadees, squirrels, people, and woodpeckers, all bound in a living web shaping and being shaped by the music of relationship. Singing, strumming, drumming, longing notes of life, danger, discordance, and belonging. So the relationships that trees point us to are very complicated. Some of them are tragic and some of them are life-giving. So, I think I'll... So, just take a moment to think about what trees do. Trees provide food for countless creatures, shade that lowers temperatures, habitat for plants and animals, medicine, and the natural ability to absorb and store carbon, absorb ozone and pollutants, convert carbon dioxide into sugar, and produce oxygen. That's just a short list, but you, you can add to that list in your, in your own minds. Their very presence and natural processes lower stress and anxiety in human beings and in other creatures. And they strengthen animals' immune systems. Trees. Trees also teach much about communication, which they do through their roots and often through fungi that's growing in the soil around their roots. Through these systems, they can share nutrients or warn of invasive species. Trees live in an ecosystem of air, water, and soil, revealing the nature of our thoroughly relational planet. 
Human lives are similarly connected with all beings in the universe, in the network of life. We are not isolated beings who seek to be in relationship, but we are already in relationship. That means that relationship does not just refer to joyful, life-giving relationships that we have with people we love, or people who we encounter in a meeting like this. Those are great. But relationality is everything in the universe, and it is filled with pain and tragedy and trauma, as it is with beauty and support and hope. So, we are looking at trees to discover all of the above. David Haskell is a biologist who speaks of this, and um, this quote from him is, is a very helpful one, I think. He um, says that all beings are biologically related with other beings. So he studies them biologically, though he's, a, he's a, an interdisciplinary scholar as well. And he argues that our ethic must therefore be one of belonging. Dwell with that for a minute. What does it mean to have an ethic of belonging? He has come to this through his study of trees. And he has also made the case that the value of, of of um, practical wisdom to the scientific and, and ecological community is very strong. And what we need to do is to pay attention to that value and to attend to the ethical implications. So when we discover that the fungi are being poisoned by other animals, and are, are by animals or other plants, and destroying the forest, the forest is beginning to die, then we have a good hint that, that something is awry. Something is not belonging. Something is not, the, the, the plants and animals are not functioning in a way that maximizes the belonging of all beings. So to understand the complexity more strongly, Haskell listens to trees, which he calls nature's great connectors. He studied, for example, the canopy of the Amazon forest in Ecuador, and particularly the canopy that is created far above the other very tall trees by the Cebos trees. The Cebos trees reach hundreds of feet above the other trees, and they have a whole different canopy in the Amazon. And in that canopy, canopy, more than half of the plants and animals of the Amazon live. So if that canopy were destroyed, so would all these plants and animals be. Now, he was interested in studying it for ecological and biological reasons, but of course others were interested in studying it for the sake of discovering new medicines and finding out how we can receive or take away some of the products of that giant canopy. Well, naturally, the wild Rani people were not too pleased with the increased study of the canopy by Westerners and Northern Hemisphere people because they really feared the destruction of the canopy and the, the tensions in human relationships became extremely strong. The dangers that they were raising are real dangers because so much of the Amazon has already been destroyed by those who mine it for resources rather than those who, who care for it in daily life. And of course, some who care for it in daily life are desperate to survive and so they also do things that harm the rainforest. But this canopy is something that David, Haskins has, David Haskell has given a lot of attention to because it's not seen by most people. You don't even see it unless you fly over or climb one of these huge structures that are built in order to study the canopy. Now, not only do we need to listen to the canopy and all the creatures therein, 
and preserve the Cebos trees, but we also need to listen to the people who live in the Amazon, which includes the Warani people. Now, the Warani people do not give names to trees or other creatures. And the reason they don't is because giving names isolates them. It makes them into separate things that then may relate to other things, but are not embedded and deeply related to these other things. So the Wairani just avoid giving species names. The spe and, and they worry that when people do that, that you just end up with a list of species instead of an understanding of the ecological wholeness of a forest or a river or some other part of the, of the natural world. Now, sometimes they give, they give trees many names, but whenever they do give a name, uh, they avoid atomistic names of one name for one species, and they, um, they give names that, that describe the context in which these beings, these species, live. So, so the name is not Sabo's tree. Um, but it's, it, it speaks to the relationship of the Sabos trees to all the other creatures that live in the Amazon. That pattern of thinking is very common in indigenous people. It's common across the world. Many indigenous languages do not use isolating vocabularies. Um, much has been written of this, and I won't go into it right this minute, but there are are ways to, there are ways to be more aware of that. Because if you use a language that doesn't separate and isolate beings from one another, then your very thinking is shaped in a relational way. Pause for refreshment. The second part of our experiment is to learn from ants. Um, and the subtitle of this section is Survival at a Crossroads. Because ants teach us a great deal about survival uh, and, and, and death and loss. So ants are, are, are great teachers about survival, partly because they have survived very well over millions of years. Um, and they have survived, they've spread across the entire world, the entire planet. The um, ants initially spread by following flowering plants. The, the sweetness of the flowering plants drew them in, and they would travel miles and miles. And uh, they began in a localized place, but they eventually are everywhere. And of course, there are many different varieties of, of ants. The most recent population study of ants, how they did it is, an, is another story. But the most recent population story of ants is that they number at approximately 20 quadrillion. So all the ants in the world are approximately 20 quadrillion. Furthermore, their biomass, if you put all the ants in the world in one great big pile, is larger than all the wild birds and mammals on the planet. In other words, they have been good at surviving. They often get wiped out, but they have persisted. So what can we learn from ants? First, let's reflect on them as a source of benefits and destruction. So they eat pests that attack plants, like beetles. They're great at, at eating be beetles that eat trees. They pollinate plants, decompose dead trees, and add nutrients to the soil. They distribute seeds, but they also eat and destroy some plants. They spread diseases, and they irritate people and other animals literally irritate and figuratively irritate. 
Their relationships with the rest of creation are very complex. As with trees, um, for example, they, are, they protect trees by eating beetles because beetles are a huge threat to trees. But they also um, have, a, have a relationship with aphids, which um, is not as good for trees. Uh, so they, their relationship with aphids is they, they drink the, the liquid that comes out of the bodies of aphids and the, the liquid is then not available to, to nourish the tree. And the aphids are terrible, destructive critters on trees. However, the research on this has been going on for years and scientists are not agreed on whether the relationship between ants and aphids is actually a beneficial one to the forest or a harmful one. Now that just shows you the complexity in itself. That some, it's, you, you can't divide things up into heroes and villains. You can't divide things, um, you can't divide the connections of the, universe, of, of the earth with, um, into those that support life and those de that destroy life because it's all mixed together. It's all part of one reality and ants reveal that big time. Ants are also very clever. They have superb communication systems. And um, they, let me just describe some of the ways that they, they communicate with each other. So in the process of foraging for food, the worker ants release different forms of pheromones from different glands. These are ants, they're so tiny, but they have different glands and they release these different pheromones. And these send diverse signals to the other ants. Some of the signals say, I have found a jackpot, there is food over here, get there fast. And some of the signals say, I found a jackpot, but it's empty now, so don't even bother. And others say, I went down this trail and I didn't find anything, so don't bother. Others say, do you remember that jackpot we discovered five generations ago? It is worth exploring because it still produces food. So some of the pheromones actually carry memory. Now it would be very confusing for ants if all of these things were happening at once, but they have these refined ways of communicating that help them to communicate precision so that they can support each other in finding the food they need. Also, when they're ready to hit the trail and go, go on a foraging expedition with other ants, they bump into each other. So they do a kind of dance. That's another way they communicate. Bees do the same thing. Um, this complex pattern has helped ants to survive over millions of years. It, has also, it, it also fails them at times, and there are other times when other animals and plants overtake them and they die out. That brings us to a really good question. So, is it good that ants survive so well or is it not so good? Most insects of the world are presently diminishing quickly. The population of insects is very small compared to what it was 10 years ago. However, ants are holding their own a little better and uh, scientists are not sure if they're um, diminishing or not because they are holding their own. However, the ants are, um, are sometimes just wiped out of a whole region and that's because of other, other animals and plants that come in and um, take away their food sources or eat them or something else like that. So ants are receivers from other beings such as fun fungi and some of them produce food for ants. So fungi sometimes um, provide food for ants and they also receive food from ants. So again, you have a, a compatibility of function. But massive colonies of ants sometimes 
wipe out massive parts of a forest. And sometimes they um, are themselves wiped out by a massive invasion of some other kind of pest. So, so survival is never guaranteed, and the question of survival is posed by ants, that is, is survival a good in itself? Or is survival actually related to the survival of all other beings? And are there times when, the, when survival is, is serving the goodness, the, the thriving of the planet more than it is destroying? But there are times when the effort for one species to survive is destroying the possibility that others can and destroying the possibility of survival in a larger scale. And so destruction continues. Some caused by human beings, some caused by ants, some caused by trees, rivers. But in the winter months of our planet, renewal is taking place. It is not fully visible. It's in the bare limbs, but it's taking place. And our mission, I think, as practical theologians, is to contribute to the flourishing wherever we can, the protection, healing, repair, and to recognize that we will never accomplish what we hope to accomplish. But what we prevent might be our small contribution to the sustainability, the viability of not the human world, God's world. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>